Okay, we'll have people come in um, soon, but it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Leppert. John Leppert is an assistant professor of urology. He, um, his clinical practice is at the VA, but he's a very integral part of our kidney cancer program here at Stanford. Uh, John uh, trained at UCLA and then came to, he is also trained in minimally invasive disease and does most of his surgeries laparoscopically, just like uh, Ben Chung that you uh, earlier heard from. Uh, John is going to, uh, ha his research has been in looking at big databases and data sets and um, Today he's going to talk to us about using big data to improve kidney cancer. John has done a remarkable job of bringing together good minds here at Stanford who are interested in kidney cancer and um, it's almost like a think tank that comes together once a month. Two times a month. Two times a month so, uh, so that people can come together with who are engaged in the same cause. So it's a pleasure to have John talk to us on um, using big data to improve kidney cancer care. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Sandy, for the introduction. It's great to see so many of you here. Uh, and I hope in this little talk to give you guys the 30,000 foot view over big data and some of the research efforts that are gonna be, I think in the near future, impacting the care of kidney cancer. Uh, so like Sandy said, I'm a urologist here at Stanford and at the Palo Alto VA and my research kind of lives in two worlds, so I wear two hats. One hat is looking at biomarkers, so how can we better diagnose cancer and identify treatments for cancer and then the other hat I wear is epidemiology, which is looking at these larger data sets. So that's what I would, was going to hopefully share with you today. In terms of disclosures, I do have grants, but I don't have any industry funding. So a lot of my grants are related to the topics of what we'd be talking about today. And for those of you who have been to prior kidney cancer support groups uh, and have heard me talk, uh, I always include this slide. So this is my grandmother at my wedding, and this is one of the reasons I became so interested in kidney cancer. So during my training as a urologist, my grandmother had a fall, and the fall led to an ultrasound, which led to an MRI, which led to a CAT scan, where they discovered that she had bilateral kidney tumors that were actually quite large. And her fall was in her late 70s, and she's now almost 10 years cancer-free after two surgeries, one for each kidney. And if I can have just, you know, a sliver of her tenacity in terms of over the course of my career, I think it will be really beneficial. So starting with just the beginning, what is big data? So you'll hear more and more about big data. I've even seen commercials now for IBM Watson where they show, uh, you know, a doctor's interacting with the computer and they're talking about big data. But what I love, I love this quote because big data can be almost whatever you want it to be. And this is a famous quote if you see any talks about big data. It talks about how big data is like teenage sex. Everybody talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everybody thinks everyone else is doing it. So everybody says that they're doing it, right? And so that's really what big data is. It's this generic term that encompasses anything that's big. And big data existed and is probably far more sophisticated in a lot of fields before it came to medicine. So if you imagine going on Amazon and buying something, there's an algorithm then that recommends additional products for you based on what you searched for, based on what you've bought. They know where you've been, they know what you've clicked on, and they use that to sell you stuff. And that is basically big data. Think about the millions of people that use Amazon and how they then parse that into a product recommendation. And that's true for many different things, social media, Google. Uh, I'll give you an example just from me. So I live here in Stanford. Google is my internet and my cable TV provider. Google's my default search engine. And my family uses Google Express to shop for stuff. So if we wanted to buy something and have it delivered to our house, Google knows what we've bought. And that data becomes incredibly valuable to Google so that they can 
target ads to me and sell me other things. And I've been willing to trade that information to them for the convenience of the services that they provide. But this is the world that we're going to start living in where all of this data is integrated. So what could big data mean then in medicine? Well, the earliest, I think, examples of big data in medicine would be looking at a large number of patients. So if you took the National Cancer Registry, uh, SEER, you could look at 100,000 or 50,000 kidney cancer patients and as a group see how well they did. And that's really just the beginning because that's the one dimension. If you think of a graph where on one uh, end of the graph there's a tick for each patient and we're looking at 10,000 patients, you can imagine then that the y-axis could be something about that patient. So now let's start talking about bigger numbers. What if we sequenced the DNA from each of those 10,000 patients? And so that's about 3 billion base pairs of data, one or a zero, for 3 billion spots. And so now 10,000 people on the x-axis, a billion points on the y-axis. And now let's talk about making it even more dimensional, which is, well, what if we do it more than once? What if we do the sequencing when they're diagnosed? and then when they start treatment, and after they've been on a treatment to see what changes, or what if they fail a treatment. So if you look at what has made this big data then possible, the obvious example is genomics. So in 1990, we launched the Human Genome Project. So that was an attempt to sequence the DNA of a human, single human. It turned out to cost $3 billion to sequence the DNA from one person. And so that involved 20 universities, multiple companies, more than five countries, a huge effort to sequence one patient. And now, if you look at what the cost has been to sequence a patient over time, you can see that the cost per base pair, so that one or zero, and the cost per sequencing a whole genome for the whole patient has plummeted. It's about a thousand bucks now. So we've gone from billions of dollars for one patient to the ability now, which has actually outpaced Moore's Law, so for those of you who are familiar with like storage in your computers and how everything gets smaller and faster over time, this has actually accelerated quicker than that law would have predicted. So it's becoming cheaper and now feasible to do this. And there's been companies then that have done this explicitly. So you'll hear ad for, ads for 23andMe or for <coughs> Foundation One or all these companies which are offering services in addition to what you can get through kind of traditional medical establishments to sequence your DNA. And so as we start looking at this highly dimensional data where we have lots of data points, lots of patients, we need to then have the tools for how we can decipher that data and actually use it for a benefit. So I'm going to give another example. Being here at Stanford, it's probably similar at other large institutions. Uh, my daughter goes to public school. She went to kindergarten. And she's in a kindergarten class with a friend. Her friend's dad happens to be the chair of genetics here at Stanford. So there was a virus that went through our kindergarten class. And our daughter was homesick with a high fever for about a week. And it turns out about half of the class was, too. The virus spreads to the rest of the kids in our family, to me, my wife, everybody's sick, we're miserable. And my daughter's friend's birthday party gets postponed because everybody's sick. So when they reschedule the birthday party, I go to the birthday party, I talk to Mike Snyder, my daughter's friend's dad, and I ask, that was an incredible virus. I mean, I, I felt horrible. I wonder what it was. And so he said, I can tell you what it was. He's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, I sequenced it. So it turns out that Mike Snyder, for two years, had been doing multiple tests on himself. So he had been doing full genomic sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics, all of these omics, on himself over the course of time. And when he got sick, it happened to be during this study, so he did everything again. And what was really interesting in this case is this was a, a respiratory syncytial virus, an RS, a common cold kind of virus that everybody had gotten and gotten sick. After that virus for him, he actually developed an antibody against the insulin receptor and became diabetic. He had no family history of diabetes. He's not obese. He's active. He rides his bike past my house on his way to work every day. 
And so this was a really interesting kind of uh, experiment where he had tested himself at multiple time points. And just a funny coincidence that we happened to include the virus that my daughter got in kindergarten, which gets published in Cell, <laughs> because he had sequenced it. And so as we start to do these omics approaches, genomics and proteomics, and we start to get this data that we've never had before, I think we're going to learn a lot about what actually happens and what changes over time for our patients. Another thing that has really facilitated this big data uh, approach, oh no, fire drill. Should we check outside? And Uh. All right, so I, th I think we're probably then okay. Uh, so um, another thing that's facilitated kind of big data approaches is that we have digitalized the medical record. So in the old days, you'd have a paper chart sitting in your doctor's office. That chart would have handwritten notes about what you had told the doctor, what the doctor had recommended, the handwritten prescription perhaps to the pharmacy would be in there. And these are all being converted to ones and zeros. So I'll bring you back to where I practice clinical medicine, which is at the VA. So the VA is actually the largest national integrated healthcare system in the United States. It includes more than 150 hospitals. It covers nine to 10 million people per year, depending on the year. And that has a single electronic health record and that health record captures everything that happens at the VA for each of those patients. So for those 9 million patients, we know since the mid-90s, every lab test and every lab test result they've ever had, every prescription they've ever picked up, whether they've refilled it, how long they've been on it, every surgery they've ever had, every diagnosis that a doctor has given them gets coded into this electronic data. And it's to the point where for just the lab results, the VA records about 1 million lab results a day that get added to this record. And these all sit in a big data storage warehouse in Salt Lake City and Austin, Texas, and these, these uh, places where then it's accessible to researchers. So if you wanted to do a study about people in the VA, you can parse through that digital information where in the past that paper record made it so that everything was isolated to the chart that was sitting in your doctor's office and the only way to get at it was that somebody would have to look at it. There's a great example then that, uh, of what this could mean in the future, and that's, this happened actually at the Children's Hospital here at Stanford. A 13-year-old girl came in with lupus, and she had multiple risk factors for blood clots. But the literature and like the textbooks don't say exactly whether or not that patient should be on a blood thinner, and blood thinners carry risks. So you could imagine a button that the doctors would have in the electronic medical record that would say, what how do patients like this patient do? Or what are the outcomes for patients like my patient? And they envision this kind of green button approach. Don't know why they've called it a green button. But the, the idea that the electronic medical record, the doctor looking at the computer, can get the data of what happens to similar patients. Sorry, guys. <laughs> my, my talk is on fire. Uh. <laughs> Did I commit a felony? Did I say fire when the fire alarm was going off? I'm going to peek outside, just make sure. All right, so we've cooled off. And so uh, this report was actually an example of where this pediatrician clicked on a button to do a search of data that was then in the medical record at Stanford where they could look at. They found 100 patients like this one, and they decided to uh, give blood thinners based on the outcomes of those other patients. So you can imagine that with the digitization of an, of an electronic medical record, we may get closer to 
what you envision with an Amazon type search and a product recommendation or a Google recommending another site for you. Another example of how things have been digitalized, and that's imaging. So it used to be that they would develop your x-ray, it would be on a piece of, you know, basically a photograph on film that would sit in a jacket in a big, uh, in a big warehouse, and they'd look at it, and then it would go back onto the shelf. Well, now all of our imaging is almost all digital. And these are ones and zeros that can then be parsed by a computer. And you can imagine that a computer could try to do a better job than even the radiologist or identify features that the radiologist might miss and do a better job at diagnosing a mass in the kidney or an area where kidney cancer could have spread outside of the kidney. So that kind of brings us to the next set of definitions. So we've heard about big data. We've heard about omics. And how are we going to then implement these approaches. And so there's two kinds of uh, catchphrases that people have used. So one is personalized medicine, and one is precision medicine. For my mind, they're pretty interchangeable, but there's some subtle differences, at least in terms of how people have interpreted them. If you could imagine for personalized medicine that I'm going to find out exactly what kind of tumor you have, maybe know more about that tumor in terms of its genetic makeup, find out that it has a certain gene mutation, and then give you a drug specifically targeted at that gene mutation and to try to give you a better chance of response because I've now personalized your therapy. So instead of treating everybody with kidney cancer the same, we're going to start being very patient-centered and each patient is unique. Precision medicine is similar, but the idea then is a little broader, which is we want to find the information that helps us categorize patients into groups that will then respond. So we do that a little bit. You have clear cell kidney cancer. You have papillary kidney cancer. You have a different type. And we can create buckets where maybe we know how groups of patients will do, and we can better define those buckets and better characterize with more information. And the more information we have, hopefully the better we are at predicting uh, outcomes and how people will do. So there's been a lot of really exciting things that have come out in just the past couple years. And a lot of these are directed towards cancer. And kidney cancer is going to be part of this for sure. So the Precision Medicine Initiative is one of these. So this was introduced in the State of the Union Address in 2015. And for this fiscal year, the government put a little more than $200 million towards this effort. And this money is basically going to create a cohort of one million patients. And in these million patients, you'll have medical records, you'll have the ability to do genomics and other kinds of testing that we would consider to create this big data resource of these million patients. And one of the first goals of this precision medicine initiative is to figure out how to do better for cancer patients. But this is also more than that, and that is uh, you'll hear a lot of criticism for how we do research, which is looking specifically at disease states. This will also look at people that are healthy. So what is normal? What is a normal variant? Maybe you have a gene mutation, but it's really not pathologic. It doesn't cause disease, doesn't cause you any problems. And so we need more information to try to figure out what the bad actors are as we start getting this information. So this is accruing now, multiple sites across uh, the whole country and trying to create this cohort. If you're interested, uh, if you go to the um, uh, whitehouse.gov uh, or to the National Cancer Institute website, there's links where you can try to sign up and they'll do a survey and they'll come to your house and do uh, additional data information collection and they'll do the samples they need to do if you wanted to participate. So that was the 2015 State of the Union Address. The 2016 State of the Union Address introduced another thing, which is this cancer moonshot idea. And so this is really trying to accelerate the cure for cancer. And this is a group effort across the whole country. Biden is kind of chairing it since his family has been touched by cancer recently. And you, uh, you see, as you look at these efforts, all of these cancer centers trying to come together for this common goal. And we were actually talking about this before the talk. One of the goals uh, of the cancer moonshot is more than just finding a cure. It's also trying to get access to the right medicines for patients, no matter where they are, access to clinical trials, and freeing this data. So one of the limitations for using this big data is that the ownership of this data is in question. 
If you have your tumor sequenced by 23andMe or another company or Stanford, is that information yours because it's your tumor? Or is that information whatever uh, the property of whoever uh, obtained the information? And so how can we break this data out of the silos that it's at, the same silos that we're capturing data in you know, the paper chart in a doctor's office? How can we then share all of this information so that we are better at using the information, specifically, uh, like we were talking about, for rarer tumors, where maybe there's only a few tumors at one institution that are of that type, and if we leave them there, we're never going to get enough information to really act on it and do a good job. So part of freeing the data is one of the goals and priorities of the Cancer Moonshot, which is just announced. This is still in the very, very much the early planning phases, but I hope that in the near future, these are things that become a reality. And back to the VA. So the VA actually has created, to date, the largest genomic resource in the world. And they've enrolled more than 500,000 veterans to be part of the Million Veteran Program. So their goal is one million. And these are large collections, then, of these resources. And one of the beautiful things about this data is it's linked to people's use of the VA healthcare system. So they have all of this additional data that can then supplement the sequencing of their genome or of their tumor or whatever else then is part of the Million Veteran Program. So wanted to give a couple examples then specifically of big data in kidney cancer just to kind of wrap up. So the Cancer Genome Atlas is a consortium group that has been sequencing different types of cancer. And this was a paper that came out in 2013 where they had se sequenced a uh, few hundred, I think it was about 300, clear cell kidney cancers. And in the future, 300 tumors may not be exciting, but when this came out, this is a big deal, and it's the largest resource that's been published to date. And I want to just show these plots. Data visualization becomes hard when you're talking about 3,000 genes that code proteins and 3 billion base pairs and 300 patients. But one of this plot right here, it just lists the gene mutations where blue is whether or not they had a problem with that gene and if for each patient. And so you can see that top line has a long width of blue, and those are VHL mutations. So loss of VHL, which is a gene you guys may have heard about, which codes for a protein, is one of the most common events in kidney cancer. And that really defines clear cell kidney cancer, so that we know that about 60 to 70 percent of patients that have clear cell kidney cancer have this mutation, and that's one of the things that triggers all of the downstream effects for a kidney cancer of this type. But you can also see that there's seven or eight other mutations there that people don't think of as dominant, but that occur with enough frequency that if we knew about it, maybe we would use drugs differently, or maybe this, well, let's say it's a BAP1. Maybe BAP1 is the Achilles heel of that tumor. And if we were able to target it specifically with the drug, we'd do even better in terms of how we would treat that patient. More data visualizations from that same effort, where they look at how genes, proteins change over the stage of tumor, over the grade of tumor. And it's more than just the gene and whether or not you have an A instead of a T at that one spot. Genes can get turned on and turned off by epigenetics. So things can get added to the outside of genes that make it so they don't get transcribed. And so the, the more we go down the rabbit hole, the more we learn how complex this problem really is. And the way that we used to think about biology is becoming more and more complicated the more that we learn. And so and back to the VA as an example, I'll just show you a little a piece of work that we've done in our group. We have 150 hospitals worth of patients, and we can search those records to find all the kidney cancer patients, and then we can take all those kidney cancer patients and find everybody that had had a kidney cancer surgery. And then we can look at everybody who had had a kidney cancer surgery and look at their kidney function on their lab tests over time. So this was an example where we had about 14,000 kidney cancer patients that had had a surgery, and we were able to link that with almost half a million creatinine measurements. So these are blood tests to measure the kidney function, to know what the kidney function did over time. And the question is, if we take your kidney out, or if we take part of your kidney out, 
what can we expect that your kidney function will do over time? Are you going to be at risk for dialysis? Are you going to be at risk for other side effects of having less kidney function? And the way that we plot this, this is a contour plot of those 400,000 blood tests. We actually see the blue line is people that had a partial nephrectomy and their kidney function is higher than people with a red line. They had a whole kidney removed, a radical nephrectomy. But one of the very reassuring things that we found from this study is that the kidney function was very stable over time. So this is 10 years at the far right of that screen, and that the average kidney function over that time actually played, uh, stayed very stable. So kidney loss of function after surgery behaves differently than people that have lost kidney function for diabetes or for high blood pressure or from some of the other things that then progress on to end-stage renal disease and transplants or dialysis, where in these patients, the kidney function actually was very stable after they had had their surgery. They found their new baseline, and that's where they stayed for, you know, in this case, 10 years. What's EGFR? Ah, sorry. Uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate. Okay. Basically, how much is the kidney filtering? And more is better. So in this case, if you have a higher GFR, your kidneys are working better than if you have a lower GFR. There's lots of jargon. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, similarly, imaging. Uh, I didn't have time to add it, but there was a paper actually that came out this week. And this is a paper from last year where they took sequencing and then they digitized the images from a CAT scan. And then they asked the computer to find differences in the computerized CAT scan images that would predict how the patients did. And with that computer information, so you might hear about machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, these other terms for how they parse computerized information. The computer was able to detect features on the CAT scans that were better than what the radiologists had said on, the, on their own at predicting outcomes. And the paper that just came out this last week, they did the same thing with digital pictures of people's pathology slides. So this was for lung cancer. And so they were able to look at lung cancer pathology slides. The pathologist gave it a score and predicted whether or not this cancer had a high chance of recurring. And then the computer did the same thing, and the computer was better than just the pathologist alone and could pick out features that you don't uh, appreciate uh, to the naked eye. And as we digitize a lot of these big data resources, I foresee this being part of the future, where we're going to have computerized algorithms to predict better what your type of cancer is on your CAT scan or on the pathology slides after it comes out. What, what is the chance that this comes back? What is SPCs? Oh, so the, these were genetic terms looking at uh, the uh, expression of uh, RNA. So, I don't, want to get, I don't want you to get hung up in it because it's not important, but the idea was they had the genetic information, and on top of that, they were able to computerize the, the CT scan. So the more aspects of the data that we have, the better that we're going to do. And here's, here's kind of my, <laughs> my favorite. I get emails, uh, because I, you may get these too, uh, that basically are the lay news reports and these come out all the time. You know, aspirin's good for you, aspirin's bad for you, a glass of wine a day is good for you, it's bad for you. There's a comedian that asks a joke, right, where he starts his, his routine and just says, milk, is it good for you? And he just pauses because the audience doesn't know what to say, right? It used to be when we, you know, I'm old enough to say when I grew up, of course, everybody had a glass of milk, that was good for you, right? But now we worry about 2%, 1%, skim milk, all of these other things. A lot of the data that's out there, especially the data that makes it to the news, and these news reports are sensationalized and poorly done, right? And so coffee, good for you, bad for you, who knows? But this was within a span of just a little bit of time. In my own email feed of these news reports, this particular drug causes bladder cancer, this particular drug doesn't cause bladder cancer. And so the truth is, a lot of these studies are limited, and they're limited because we don't have access to this big data resource. They're often done at one center. They're done with a small number of patients. They're done with a very specific group of patients, things that aren't generalizable. So here's a way to round it, and that's big data. So this actually just came out this past week as well, where they took everybody in Sweden. Sweden has a birth-to-death national health care system, so it's a lot like the VA except bigger, and that they capture every drug you've been on, every lab test you've had, every surgery, everything you've ever had as part of your medical record from your birth to your death, as long as you're in Sweden. 
And they looked at every single drug that, that, was in that, that was in that resource and said, does this drug have an association with cancer? Any cancer, as one analysis, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, they started going down the common cancers. They didn't do kidney. But this is the type of data that is needed to really say something with some authority in a retrospective way about whether or not coffee causes cancer or a drug causes cancer. We need this kind of data. We need to do it in a very methodologically rigorous way. And a lot of what you see in the news just doesn't meet that criteria. Yeah. Now, it turns out you go on and have all of this data going on and coming back again, and then you have people, depending exactly on who has a stake in the game and all the rest of it, the data could go on and get interpreted a variety of different ways. Right. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> right. So, so, Bill, if you don't mind, I'll paraphrase your question, which is uh, a lot of bias, a lot of influence. I started my talk with the disclosure slide, right? A lot of things that influence you, you will then influence your perception of the data, right? And so absolutely right. And as we do research with big data, it is so big that you will find things that are statistically significant. It's just a matter of if you look, right? And some of those things won't make any sense, right? You'll find data that if you eat pomegranates, you have uh, an Audi belly button, right? And that will be statistically significant in this data set because you're looking at 10 million people. But it means nothing. There's no clinical reason to say that that link occurs. So you not only have to be smart about what questions you ask, and you have to do the methods in a rigorous way, it has to then pass the sniff test. It has to have face value that this is possible. And then once you have that piece of information, you can't stop there. You have to validate it. You then have to test it prospectively. And so for kidney cancer, in a very kind of, to try to bring this back specifically, if we found a gene that was associated with kidney cancer outcomes, looking at patients that had been in one clinical trial, then the next step is we have to recreate that study with a different set of patients. And we probably are going to try to work on a prospective clinical trial for that gene mutation and that new drug that we're giving to that patient group so that we can balance out the bias and we can try to do the best that we can. And a lot of what you're going to see in the news was way before those steps have ever occurred. So I'm going to end my talk then with uh, a slide. So this is a slide from the Cassini space probe where it passed Saturn and it's looking back and that little dot down there is Earth. And I think that that's what we're going to do when we look back at how we treat kidney cancer maybe 10 years from now, 20, 30 years from now, just like we look back at leeches and the, you know, the middle ages of surgery. And our goal really is to stop treating everybody the same, to personalize or have a more precise way to deliver drugs, to deliver surgery, to deliver the right care to the right patient at the right time. And the better that we can do with categorizing patients and getting information, these big data type resources, I think the better that we're gonna do for our patients. So looking forward, we need what turns out to be a much more diverse group of researchers. We need people that are familiar with computational science, data science. We need the biologists and the people that are in the lab doing the work. We also need the clinicians and we need the patients. We need this data then to be freed and freely flowing between the basic uh, research groups at the different places and we need to then implement that data in a rigorous way. And I think that's what's exciting and what's down the road for kidney cancer in particular in the very near future. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry about the fire drills. Thank you for the information. Uh, I have a, I think, fairly simple question, but as uh, the bins for precision medicine get filled, does it, the filtering become more granular to make it more personalized? Let me, let me make sure I'm understanding. Are you saying that when people enroll in those cohorts and the cohorts fill up, 
Well, you, you mentioned that, you know, right now um, we use more of a precision technique where, you know, all the patients that had clear cell go in one bin. Yeah. Well, over time, as that bin gets filled and you start to see how different patients react to different medications or whatever, the, does the filtering become more granular? So as, as you get more information on these different patients, you can apply it to new patients in a personal method. Yes, and so I'm gonna take that to the extreme, which is there's this concept of a clinical trial of one patient, right? So as we learn from prior clinical trials, and we can take that bin, and let's say the bin starts at clear cell, that bin will then get divided into clear cell type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, based on those mutations. The bins are going to start to get smaller and smaller. And as we have more and more experience, we'll know how people have done with the 10 drugs now that we have for advanced kidney cancer in each of those bins to the point where we're eventually going to have a single patient that comes in. They have their tumor sequenced, let's say, or some other kind of information that helps us decide what bin they fit best in and then we give them the drug that we think is best and we can look at whether or not that works. And so as, as we become more precise in how we categorize patients, I think you're right, we're gonna become more personalized and the ultimate will be that each patient is treated individually based on those uh, categorizations that we can do. And that clinical trial of one patient is kind of that idea. Hi, uh, so two questions, hopefully useful for everyone. Um, so for those of us who are very technologically inclined, I saw your chart of the genome sequence drop by a factor of one million or so, but as you know, it takes a decade, maybe two, for that to have any tangible improvement for the average patient. So how does someone um, avail themselves of these new technologies or the trials or, or whatever could be done earlier? Right. And especially in the case of the genome, if it's only a thousand or two thousand dollars, is there some way we can make that useful for ourselves right. in the short term. So one is you can always be proactive, and these companies now, 23andMe, Foundation One, make it so that you can do that on your own and without the need of your doctor. You basically can request your pathology slides. They get sent to a company like Foundation One, and they will do an analysis. At this point, I think a lot of times that might be a waste of money if we don't have a way to act on that information. So you may be able to get the information, it may not be actionable yet, but you can definitely do it, and if you wanted to be proactive, you could do it now on your own. The second thing I wanted to say is I don't want to trivialize the whole genome sequencing, because you're right, the cost makes it easy. What's actually now the trick is uh, the data analysis of that sequencing and then acting on the data. So yes, you can spend $1,000 and you can sequence it, and then it's gonna sit on a hard drive, and it may take some postdoc or some data scientist a few months then to parse through that data to find out what your sequencing actually looked like. And that's actually, I think, gonna be the rate-limiting step for a lot of this work, is once we get the actual data, how do we then interpret it and act on it? In the future, what that may mean is as we develop new drugs, they're so slow to come to the market, right? If we develop a drug for lung cancer, we may be able to repurpose it to kidney cancer to bring it to the market much quicker, especially for patients that have failed traditional therapies. And so I, th I hope that in the nearer future, maybe even shorter than 10 years from now, that the process to approving drugs, especially for specific indications, becomes much quicker because we can repurpose things that are already in the pipeline as we learn more about mutation. And you'll actually see this now, and you might hear about breast cancer and Angelina Jolie having a mastectomy because she's BRCA1 uh, positive, right? And now there's whole groups of researchers who are looking at BRCA cancers, BRCA cancers, which may be breast, prostate, and these other cancers. And they're starting to try to treat them in the same bucket, no matter where they came from. And that may accelerate some of this drug discovery. But you're right, there's still this, there's still a moat between you and then getting the data and then acting on the data might even be another moat, another step that we haven't really figured out how to do it at, and scale. So, uh, and along those lines, you had the example of your daughter's friend's father runs the general department. He can sequence anything he wants to. Are there open source tools or the equivalent available for an average person to just start to tinker around with that? 
Ah, that's a great question. With the sequencing, you're still technology driven because you need the technology to actually do the sequencing um, and the computational power to do that. So maybe a few people might have access to that, uh, but that would be really rare. But the other things may be quicker. So let's say your electronic medical record. There are uh, uh, companies, Google Health tried this, but I think they folded, that would then store your medical electronic health record. And one in that data then, I think that is much more um, uh, the, the barrier in terms of doing your own analysis of your own health record or groups of health records if we've compiled things into a resource. I think that is actually within reach. And that's something you know you could do uh, with kind of off the shelf kind of stuff. Uh, more the DIY kind of analysis. There's also Python libraries out there that will do Right, so once you had the sequencing, absolutely right. In fact, a lot of the computational work uh, is R-based, Python-based, and that's actually usually out there in public GitHubs. And so once you had the data, you could actually pull out the resources, and if you had the computational power, look at your own sequencing. That's true. Uh, but you got to get the data first, and that's the trick, yeah. So the bottleneck is getting the data. Getting the data and then getting it to you so that you could look at it yourself, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, John. It's amazing. Thanks for all that you do for our and submissions.